big round of applause for Ant from Ikai Guru. <laughs> Stanley, uh, I live in London, I'm South African. Um, my partner Ryan is over there. Uh, yeah, there's three of us, he's an Australian because no one who lives in London is actually from the UK. I had a Dutch last week, but I don't speak any Dutch. Sorry. Oh, that's an issue. Yeah. I'm South African, I can speak very bad Afrikaans. So. Um, in South Africa, I'm what they call a, um, a, 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 a soti, or translates to soap peel, which means that um, I have one leg in South Africa and one leg in Britain, and then my penis is somewhere else. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's what you kind of grow up in South Africa. But the main thing, today we're going to talk about a Cloud Guru, not so much about the company, but more about how we built the platform. Because um, one of the key things about it is that it's completely serverless. We don't run an entire uh, server in our infrastructure. We're big users of Lambda. We've been very early adopters of Lambda. And we're doing a lot of things with AWS's Lambda platform that not many people are doing, um, which is a bit scary when we hit a problem uh, because no one can help us. Um, <clears throat> but we believe there's a lot of value and it gives us a lot of value. So we're going to kind of talk more about how we built our platform and also about Lambda in general. Um, so at a high level, if you go to that URL, you will, you should, you'll be able to sign up. You can get discounted access to some of our courses. There's a Docker and GitHub bundle available, I think, for 36 euros. And then there's a uh, AWS associate courses. So AWS has five courses, um, three of which are an associate junior level. So you can get all three of those for 29 euros if you want to get that. Or if you just want to enter the draw, there's another option to just enter the draw and not, not take any courses. Um, go to that URL, uh, it's, we use Typeform, I'll talk about what's fit behind that. Um, so, talk about Lambda, um, there's a concept of um, e e e ephemeralization, which is essentially doing more with less. Um, as technology grows, technology advances, you do more and more with less and less. A guy called uh, Bucky Fuller came up with this in the 30s, a uh, bit of an eccentric American. Um, but it still applies a lot today because Lamb Lambda is exactly that and also so everything we say about Lambda probably the same applies to uh, Google's cloud functions which got released a week ago. Um, so if you go to that URL, I'm going to really give you a really quick example of how Lambda can be really powerful in really simple manner ways. What will happen is you go to the URL, we've got the DNS is hosted with root 53 and AWS, sends you to the S3 buckets which then will do a redirect to a type, type form URL. It's a really, really lazy man's uh, URL shortener um, for us to basically create English readable um, URLs so people remember. Once you go to type form, once you hit the submit button at the end of it, uh, Zapier will then get the information. Zapier then triggers a Lambda function. Lambda then writes to DynamoDB. Uh, which then triggers a DynamoDB stream, which then triggers another Lambda function, which, which then calls Campaign Monitor. Campaign Monitor is a marketing email service. They have a transactional email service where you can, via an APR, trigger off an email. We use Campaign Monitor because it's pretty. There are other services that you can use, like SendGrid and MailChimp and all kinds of things. Um, so you get your email. Once you get your email, there'll be a link. You click on the link. You can go to our nice responsive website. Um, on your phone. Uh, yep, that's it. You can, it is responsive, actually. Um, shockingly. Um, when you log in, you use Auth0 as authentication mechanism. Uh, once you're registered with it, Intercom, you'll create a record on Intercom, which is our messaging system and kind of customer management system. Intercom then has webhooks, where Intercom has webhooks then call API Gateway, which is another AWS service, which triggers another Lambda function, which then goes back to DynamoDB and tells us that you've actually registered. Um, in terms of the competition, you don't have to actually have to register, you just finish put the phone on the cloud form. Um, there is an issue which I picked up today. Uh, campaign monitors, transactional email features are working, which was great. Uh, so you might get the emails tomorrow, there's a problem there. Um, you might get them today, it might have been fixed since like 6 p.m. when I last checked it. So the key thing about all of this is this nice little workflow, it's completely powered by Lambda, these three little Lambda functions. Um, most of the 
uses webhooks, it, it integrates really nicely. The key element is that there's absolutely no service. It took eight hours to write all of that end to end. Um, I keep reusing it. We typically speak with a lot of AWS user groups, and we you, you give away courses, give discounted courses at most of the user groups using this exact same process. But the key thing for us is we just worried about connecting services. We didn't worry about provisioning storage or provisioning a network or provisioning um, an operating system or patching an operating system. We're just connecting services. And that's where Lambda's real strength is. It's kind of this API glue between everything. Um, so, a bit more about Lambda. This concept of creative destruction has been around before. Uh, a guy called Joseph Schachter kind of came up with the term, I think, in the 40s or 50s. There's a few other books in it, and there's a lot around it. Uh, but essentially, creative dis destruction is how new services kind of destroy the value of, of the older services as you build a new, higher order, higher value service on top of old services. So the new thing destroys the value of the old thing. So if we look at Lambda, let's look at Lambda architecture, I understand. And this will be similar for, for Google Cloud Functions. Essentially, it's just kind of, um, functions in the cloud. So, from a creative destruction point of view, historically you had, um, uh, when electricity was invented, you generated it at home. Um, then the power grid got created, and now you could share electricity between people. Then people started building data centers, um, and now you could share uh, power from multiple sources via data center. What happens from a data center perspective, the value of that power of an individual um, uh, power plant is significantly uh, diminished doesn't mean it has an any value, but it's just significantly diminished because of um, the technology advancements. So on top of your data center, you have a network that connects all of the devices, ship data, people create storage arrays, um, you then have servers on top of that, um, and it's all happily distributed. And you know the actual value of an individual data center, the, the ability to provision all of this on site is less important. Um, so the value gets driven down as all of this gets commoditized and turns into products and turns into utility long term. And then you look at another layer on top of that, so, you know, you, virtualization comes around, you have uh, VMware, Citrix Zen, the rest, there's this container thing, I don't know if it's going to catch on, um, where people are able to abstract um, another layer of abstraction and then orchestration on top of that, Mesosphere, Kubernetes, whatever else. That's 90% of what a Lambda stack looks like. What, what um, Google Cloud Functions will be built on. It's all, it's all Docker, to be perfectly honest. It's all containers. All that AWS have done is they put this RESTful interface in front, in front of it and they've restricted what you can do with it. They haven't opened it up, they've, they've limited it. Um, and I'll talk about, and the irony is by, by limiting what you can do with an underlying container, allows you to do a lot more with it. Sounds a bit strange. So, the main thing is, so they've limited your runtime environment. So if you're using Lambda, you can only use um, Node.js, JavaScript on the back end, it's way forward. Uh, Java, Python, they've limited the execution time. A function can only run for five minutes. Uh, they've limited the ways you can call that function. Uh, they've limited the resources you can allocate to that function. It's completely ephemeral. These things disappear off they've, they've run. Um, but what happens if you do that? You have tiny containers. There's no other application dependencies other than the dependencies of that exact function. A container of under 10 megabytes. Um, typically, like Node.js is, what, 2, 3 megs the runtime. So you can have containers under 5 megs, or probably about 3 megs. Because you, the Lambda functions are often 10 lines of code, 20 lines of code. So it's really, really small, which means they start up really quickly and also disappear really quickly. Um, you're not patching this complicated um, environment with lots of dependencies. You know, um, what you as a end user have to do is worry about the dependencies of that individual function. And then AWS or Google, whoever it is, worries about the rest. And that stack they have to worry about is highly standardized. Um, there's limited interfaces, you know, it only integrates with so many different interfaces in a very standardized way. It's significantly easier to maintain. The other big thing is they increase the utilization of the underlying infrastructure by, by driving the standardization and restricting what you can do with it. Um, they also reduce environment configuration, reduces your maintenance because it's just highly standardized environment. 
The other thing we don't realize is this way of working enforces microservices by design. You cannot deploy a monolithic application. You can't take um, Drupal, you cannot take WordPress, you cannot take um, whatever monolithic application you have today and deploy it to Lambda. You have to tear it apart, decompose it, refactor it, and rewrite it to go to Lambda or Google Cloud Functions. So, Steve, Steve, um, Steve, um, I don't even know how to pronounce the name, but um, Sanofsky, former Microsoft um, Executive Vice President, he ran Office, I think he ran SharePoint as well at one point. He put out a blog post this week actually, and he talked to it, in this particular blog post he was talking about um, Office um, and how when they started to, Office started to becoming, started to become more of a business um, application as opposed to a home application. Um, a lot of sysadmins out there had figured out how to, that they'd reverse engineered the Office installation process. So they could actually install Office in an automated fashion across, um, you know, a thousand PCs, 10,000 PCs. And these engineers, because Office was never intended to do that, and these, these PCs, these engineers actually become highly valuable because they knew how to configure the actual installation scripts, you know, to have variable installation on that. What they found is then they said, well, you know, this is really hard and it's, you know, they're, they're configuring files that only 20 people in the world were ever supposed to actually be able to know how to use because that's supposed to be a standard office installation. Um, so what they did is they said, oh, you know, let's go to the next level and let's build a really easy way to install office across thousands of PCs. And, you know, and then what they did is they then took it to their core community, which happened to be these brilliant sysadmins who reverse engineered the office. Um, installation process. What they found is all this great work Microsoft had done to make Office really easy to install has absolutely destroyed the value that those engineers could bring to the organization. It made them unnecessary. And in many respects, this is exactly what creative destruction does. Is that it's a higher order service which makes whatever the lower order service is less necessary. And also the skills required to do that less necessary. You know, um, the data center operator is not a very important job anymore. 30, 40 years ago, it was a very important job. Um, so from a credit destruction point of view, this is what Lambda and services like Google Cloud Functions are going to do as well. The lower order services, as more applications get rewritten, or brand new applications get rewritten, your ability to configure a network switch or ability to, to deploy a virtual machine is not really going to be very important because developers are just going to write functions. They're not going to write an application that needs to run in this operating system that needs to have these dependencies that has this performance restrictions around it. They just write functions. So <clears throat> that's something everyone kind of needs to be aware of. So one of the other great things about it is Patrick Dubois. I don't know anyone to know who this guy is. He knows Patrick is. Patrick is a reputation. He's um, the godfather of DevOps. He's one of the guys who came up with the term. You can have a long argument with them about whether it's a capitalized O or not on DevOps, but that's a nice conversation. Um, he did this tweet the other day. Well, this reality is that as you move up the as a service stack, infrastructure as a service, software as a service, PaaS, all of that, um, is developers and sysadmins and everyone else in the room is no longer worrying about their undifferentiated heavy listening. You're not worrying about patching something because. Um, there's some new, uh, some new vulnerability out there. You're not worried about a lot of the performance underlying performance condition, uh, about the performance of the application so much. What you're more worried about is creating new and wonderful applications that deliver value to your customers or value to your users, whoever that community is. Um, and that's one of the great things about these kind of new services that are appearing, and they're not going to go away. Um, the reality is it's still very, very new because you cannot move an existing app to this, but it allows new, new possibilities. So I'm going to talk a bit about what we're doing. Um, so big thing for us is the concept of ongoing improvement. Um, Eli Goldratz is quite famous for his theory of constraints um, about how to improve the um, efficiency and throughput within particularly uh, manufacturing organizations, but a lot of it does uh, um, applied to computing as well. 
He has the concept of activating a resource versus utilizing a resource. Activating a resource is turning it on. Uh, utilizing your resource is actually using it. And what you find most cloud computing providers and also what frameworks like, uh, well, frameworks or orchestration tools like Mesosphere and Kubernetes or you know, if you go back to something like VMware's DRS, all they're about doing is about increasing the utilization of a, of a resource and um, decreasing that, that activated time where it's doing nothing and not delivering value. So we went about building our, our platform. We said, um, we don't want to be paying for servers. Um, we don't want to be have an ops team who is, is basically only going to be busy when there's a new patch or something goes wrong. Uh, it's about increasing the utilization, have a higher utilization model. So Ryan's brother, um, this guy, Sam, um, with stars. You, you gotta do the stars. Um, so I had fun with the <laughs> animations, by the way. Um, he's, he's, the last time you got creative, it's a bit scary. Um, anyone remember this thing, d <laughs> okay, so, so, so Sam used to work for Microsoft. The first thing he did at Microsoft was get rid of the bricks. He was on the NTFS team, uh, Windows 7. Um, so he's a, he's a cheerful fellow. Um, he got rid of our, our precious bricks. Um, so when he said, okay, let's take, actually launch our own school and take the content that Ryan produced and uh, let's take it to the next level and produce something effective. Sam said, hey, let's use Lambda. Um, which us being idiots said, hey, that's a great idea. So this is a traditional stack, and this is where we would have looked at it historically. You've got your traditional three tiers. You've got your presentation tier on all your different devices with your um, responsive web apps and everything else on that. Um, talking to an API, talking to your middle tier. Your middle tier has a lot of functions within it. All your business logic gets applied there. Um, authorization, authentication. There's code orchestration happens there. Service integrations, and then there's a, a data tier, typically a database of some sort. Um, and those kind of three kind of system tiers. That doesn't work in a Lambda world, doesn't work in a microservices world, and there's a lot of constraints around it because there's lots of bottlenecks within that. So I said, so the historical model was always the front end tier, you have your user interface, client side model binding, client side service layer that talks back into your service side service layer, um, service side model binding. So it's like DB mapping and talks to database storage. Those are kind of very traditional three-tier um, architecture, which has been around for years and it's definitely not going anywhere. We said, well, let's, how do we reinvent this? How do we do this slightly differently? So there's the stack again. Let's change it up. One of the key things for us is a lot of the services you have in that middle tier are standardized services that occur within every, every single application. We don't want to, um, from our side, write our own authorization, authentication service, because there's lots of good ones out there we can just consume as a service. So Auth0 is the one in particular that we use. Um, from a data storage perspective, we don't necessarily want to create our own database abstraction, um, you know, and basically an API with a database behind it. There are services out there that we can use. So when we made design decisions, or one of the biggest question was, um, is there something out there today that we can use and is it better than what we can do ourselves? Um, typically when you come up to a company that just does an authentication service, 99.99% of the time it's going to be better than anything you can write yourself. Um, in the case of Walt Zero is a very good example of that. So what we said is a whole de design philosophy is basically whatever you're not, whatever is not core to your business, where you can procure a service out there that is better than what you can do yourself, do that. And only write and only create the functionality that is core to your business. The other unique thing about our architecture, or not so unique, is that we do a lot of the orchestration between the services on the client side. So there's not a lot of, a lot of integration happens on the client side. These Lambda functions that sit at the back um, often don't integrate with anything. They just do a single, single task on its own. If that task fails, it has absolutely zero impact on any other service. Which is from a scalability, performance and reliability uh, point of view is really good because that's one dependency that would have been there in a monolithic app. It doesn't exist anymore. So
So what we have today is you get this new model for us. Is you still have your, your big your client side um, tier. So we've got a single page app, uh, nice and responsive. And um, interface, you still have your client side model binding, you still have your client side service layer, but that client side service layer, instead of talking to one API with a lot of fat services behind it, is now talking to multiple APIs and it's doing orchestration within it. So we use Firebase, for example, as a, as a database. Um, so that's just an API call from the front end straight to Firebase. Um, then we have known there's a whole series of microservices underneath um, that we deploy using Lambda and then also use other services like Authorsphere and Intercom. So from a developer point of view, we've taken a lot of heavy lifting out of the back end side of things. All we really spend a lot of our time focusing was on the front end. Actually, that's where all our difficulty is actually on the front end. Um, because the back end stuff is so easy now, it's ridiculously easy. Um, the key thing for us when we develop a microservice, we develop a Lambda function or whatever it's going to be, um, is that the service needs to do one thing and one thing well. You don't want that, that particular service to be able to do five different things because then you introduce dependencies. Um, and then you're going to, <coughs> it's more likely it's going to crash, and more likely it's harder to debug. There are a lot of issues with that. You know, just do one thing, one thing well, and Lambda is perfect for that. So this guy called Mel Conway uh, came up with the concept of Conway's law, uh, basically saying organizations design systems. Um, the way this, they design systems is constrained by the way they're organized. So what that means, um, in more slightly more layman's terms, is if you have a big dev team, that 40 people in a room, they're going to design nice, nice monolithic applications. Because the guy who's writing the authentication service is sitting next to the guy who writes the authorization service, um, he sits next to the guy who writes a lot of the business logic. And instead of calling those services via abstracts and APRs, they're now just direct linking with an application. Because the guy sits next to him, that's the easy thing to do. Um, <coughs> the reality is, you don't you get monolithic apps, you don't get distributed or redundant fault tolerant apps out of this. So it's implement implement microservices, what you need really need to do is actually to make those people sit apart from each other. Which is a bit, a bit strange. You think, well, I want to implement a new architecture after we have to tell people to sit away from each other and reorganize. And the reality is, that's actually what you need to do. The way we work is that we consume third party services, so whether the fact that that team um, that uh, that writes all zero, for example, doesn't work for us, doesn't matter. But they are abstracted from us. We don't have direct communication to their devs and don't get them to make um, specific changes to their code for us. We, we deal with that standard interface. Um, all we worry about is the stuff that's unique to us. So kind of mimic the Conway's all uh, theory <coughs> by design because we're small and can't do everything. And we just worry about the stuff in the back end the small stuff that's unique to us. So this is what our application stack looks like today. Um, actually, it's slightly evolved from there. So we use a number of third-party services. AWS is about 50-60% of the services we use, but we do use things like Firebase, which is a Google service. Um, Intercom, which is a third-party service, but actually also it's an AWS fault zero, just between a zero and AWS. Um, we consume services and orchestration is done on the front end and then some orchestration is done on the back end. Say 60, no, probably more, 70, 80 percent of orchestration is done on the front end. Wherever something needs to be a secret, so for example, you go into one of our forums and you answer a question on a forum, we want to send an email notification to the person who asked, who asked the question to say that someone's answered it. We don't want to have that person's email address sitting on the front end of the client. So we use a Lambda function to do that. That Lambda function does has absolutely no impact um, on the rest of the app. It doesn't crash an app, um, which if it was potentially sitting on the front end or one with the cap, it might potentially crash an app. Um, the big thing with it, this does for us is we just have developers. We don't have operations. We don't have DevOps. We just have devs who are responsible for those applications. They're responsible for the integrations responsible for testing integrations. If something breaks, the devs fix it. Um, saves us a lot of money, saves us a lot of time, 
also make sure when they're, when they're responsible for it, coming out, also make sure it's fixed. Um, Sam has this very bad habit of releasing stuff from Friday afternoons, um, <coughs> which is not good. Um, uh, but on the other side, he's also available on Friday evenings if it does break. Um, it doesn't happen often. Um, I think it's happened once, to be honest. But the key thing for us is that adopting the service architecture um, enforces microservices. Um, I'll go back. It enforces microservices for us, enforces a distributed way of working um, because we're consuming a lot of third party services. Um, and we, by default, we kind of get this microservices ideal distributed architecture um, just by the nature of some technology choices we've made. So, a really simple example of how some of this stuff works someone looks into our sites, also will authenticate them. Uh, this is what's zero. It's really simple. I've talked a lot about it, but it's a really simple one that gives us a lot of, um, gives us a lot of benefits. Uh, it's identity service, that's all it is. You log into a site, you can choose what your drop down looks like. You can write your own little um, login screen if you want to and just call the APIs or they give you one that you can call. You can add it to your site really quickly. Um, you can choose how many social providers you want. So we've just chosen I think it's six. Um, you can do bizarre like if you want to log into your app with Fitbit, so it's a fit app. Fit. Um, it's also got single um, single sign on out the box. The main thing for us is that we are one connection to what's zero, and then it's basically move the slider and we've got connections into hundreds of other um, service providers, identity providers. So, the big thing with what's zero is it uses JSON web tokens, they're an open industry standard. Um, Standard, or open industry standard method uh, for, for tokenization from a security perspective. Um, there's a open um, library you can use to, to decode, generate, and utilize JSON web tokens. All the services we use use JSON web tokens. Um, so, a really simple service. You log in, you go to Auth0, Auth0 will delegate you a JSON web token. Um, the JSON web token sits in your browser, you then use that to authenticate back into Firebase. Um, so if you log into our site, um, it'll go to Firebase and see what courses you have, for example. Um, then if you want to view, view a course, all our videos sit within S3, the um, JSON web token is then used to authenticate you back with S3 um, to allow you to do that. So that's just the kind of technology behind it. The orchestration of that process is done at the front end. Um, that's all done by JSON Web Token that's handled by Auth0. Expiration on that, that token is also handled by Auth0. We don't have to worry about that. We've built the back-end transcoding pipeline. That's, that was completely serverless. No Lambda involved in that either. Back-end transcoding pipeline. Uh, when you want to vi view a video in standard definition, HD, different speeds, whatever, we've got to transcode multiple versions of that. So a really simple way. Run and upload the video to S3. Uh, Lambda function gets fired. Lambda function calls off uh, Elastic Transcoder service. It then transcodes that original video into multiple different versions of it, puts it back into another S3 bucket. Um, Lambda function then gets fired after that to basically let the application know the new videos are ready. Um, and makes it also does a change to the S3 bucket to make it public or make it to that, those particular. Um, videos to make it public and then someone can view it. No servers involved. It's a really light process. It's about 60 lines of code between all those Lambda functions. Really simple. If you try to do that with servers with EC2 instances, um, it would take you a lot longer. It's really, really easy. Um, so the main thing, the last kind of takeaway I have is you know, just try out kind of new things because service architecture can give you huge value and you don't have to do it like we have and build the entire application. You can just build simple workflows with it and it's really not very really easy. Um, JavaScript is probably your best way to go because then you can try Google Cloud functions and um, Lambda because um, they both have no JS but it's simple and you can get value out of it in under eight hours of work, uh, probably two or three hours to get experiences. So yeah. 
Um, one last kind of element, the whole, but it's not, it's not Nirvana, there are problems. Um, Atomic transactions, so we're doing lots of orchestration on the front end, you can't guarantee all the services are going to be able to get back to your client in time. So if you want to do an atomic transaction, you've got to do it at the back end um, using one of these card functions, whether it's Google or Lambda. Um, so that's a challenge you've got to be aware um, if you need to guarantee a transaction completes. Data analytics is fun. It's a fun little challenge we have today because we have data all over the place. There's data in AWS, there's data in Intercom, there's data in all zero. How do we know how users are behaving across this application? Because all the data about the behavior is in all these different services. But we do have a solution to that, but it's, it's, it's not as easy. Um, native apps can be fun. Um, you can overcome, overcome it, but um, there are some challenges with, with native apps. Um, Sam's probably a bit more aware of those than I am. Um, the other irony is business dependencies you don't think about. So if you sign up to our site, you are implicitly agreeing to the service terms and service conditions of all the other providers we use. So you agree to the Auth0 um, and Intercom and Stripe if you do payment via Stripe or PayPal if you do payment via PayPal. You implicitly agree to all of that. Most people don't realize. So it's a really quick way to get value out. <coughs> but what you might be doing is sharing your data with lots of people. Um, our philosophy is data is a liability, so we keep as little as possible. The only thing you have to give us is email, email address and uh, your name. You don't have to give us a real name. So you have to be kind of aware of that kind of thing. So if you want to use this architecture for highly sensitive data, be careful. Um, you might have to, instead of, for example, using Auth0, if you want to use it for something that is highly sensitive, you might still have to build your own authentication service. So just be a little bit aware of that. Um, big benefits, obviously, um, it's really fast to continuously innovate. Um, the initial, the MVP of the site took 19 days to develop. Fully functional, from scratch, um, learning management system, 19 days. Um, rapid time to market as well. Um, obviously, I said 19 days as well. <coughs> so it lets you get something out there quickly and prototype it really, really quickly. Incredibly low cost. Our single biggest um, bill from AWS is bandwidth bill, so 80% of AWS is bandwidth. Um, because we're only paying for what we're using. You know, we're not paying for an EC2 instance that's sitting there. Um, our single biggest bill across the board is actually our credit card fees. Um, that 2.9% we pay on credit cards. That's our, that's our, after salaries, that's our single biggest cost. Our uh, business, yeah. Um, and it makes complex workflows really simple because you keep breaking it up into little bite-sized chunks. You don't try and write one huge function or series of functions that are tied together. Um, you just do little bite-sized chunks and it's reusable functions the whole time. Um, so that's, well, that's kind of us. That's it. Is that comic sense? Yes, it's comic sense. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. See, our data is sitting all over the place. So, for example, Firebase, um, I think that we've got 40,000 users, Firebase is about 38 megs of data. That's literally the size of that database. Um, because we're just storing the data that the other services don't need to store. Um, so, from the primary authentication process, it comes down to what service has, has that data. So, all our contents is in S3, for example. So, it'll be limited to the security controls that S3 can give us. The same with Firebase, it's limited to the security controls Firebase can give us. Most user data, almost all of our user data is between Auth0 and Intercom. Um, and it comes down to the fine grain controls that those services give us. Um, yeah, so, so making those service choices. Case, you would need to yeah. yeah. Um, JSON Web Tokens is a good way to handle like, tokenization and to identify, yes, I am who I am, but the actual authorization element is heavily reliant on the service you're using. Yeah. 
What's the memory footprint of the client application? Um, the entire app is actually two megs. Oh, it's, it's less now. Um, memory footprint's a It's a single page app, Angular JS. Um, yeah, you load these third party JSON SDKs uh, or JavaScript SDKs yeah, and yeah. use the footprint. Um, I don't know what it is. We're about to go through the optimization of it. Um, I don't know what the actual memory footprint is off the top of my head. Um, but essentially, from a, it's a single page app using Angular JS, um, none of the content gets preloaded. It's just um, either loading JSON from Firebase on demand when it's required, and then the content, the actual videos, um, and like questions and any lecture notes, for example, get loaded out of S3 um, when required. So it kind of depends what you're doing. But the actual, the not the memory footprint, but the size of the single page app is just under 2 megs. It's going to go down to like just over one, like 1.1 or 1.2 shortly. Um, it's something we spend a lot of time optimizing because you know, it has a big impact on performance. Yeah. And we use four CDNs. I think something like that. Four. There's, um, there's other fun things. You write a single page app, good luck getting Google to search it. You have to do pre rendering and all kinds of other fun things um, to actually be as registered and searched and indexed by Google, which is fun. There are a lot of other challenges. Our biggest advantage is it's extremely economical. So to stream a, let's say, an eight-hour course, it will cost us around 12 cents total cost to company for the entire technology involved. So you think about that, you sell it for 30, 29, 30 dollars, make a lot of money So um, we still have our, our normal costs, which are our staff costs, but we're not yeah. paying system administrators to keep EC2 instances alive. Because the server it's just our costs, our main cost of developers, and essentially um, rent. <laughs> yeah, essentially. That's how we can do. So if you go on and look at our courses compared to um, a lot of other courses online, they'll charge you a monthly fee. We just charge a one-off fee of like twenty-nine dollars, and um, we come in extremely economical compared to our competitors. Yeah. So we pass the cost on to our customers. We have the same model as Amazon. Basically, we actually don't really care too much about margins. We just want huge volumes. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, the fun one. Um, so one of the interesting, really interesting things around Lambda is um, Amazon just kind of launched it without an ecosystem around it, without any client-side tooling, without any additional tooling. So the first iteration of the site went out in August last year. It was Grunt Scripts from a desktop. Um, so JavaScript calling the... Um, AWS SDK and do the deployment from the desktop, basically running a grunt script that did the deployment. What we have today is a full continuous integration pipeline uh, using Travis, uh, Travis CR. That's taken a while um, to get there. Testing is still a bit of a challenge. Um, what we have seen happen in the community though is a lot of people seeing such value in Lambda is there's a lot of community tools out there. So there's a serverless framework. Um, which actually has some deployment capabilities in it and it's building some testing capabilities in it. So we're looking at actually starting to adopt that rather than kind of doing our own thing and we're just going to start using someone else's thing and probably rather contribute back to that. Um, there's another service called Kappa, which is also an open source tool written by a guy called Mitch Garnett who wrote the Botu client uh, for AWS, so apart from CLR. Um, that's pretty good. That allows you to do a lot of local testing. You can, um, emulates an a, a event that will fire off your function. So you just run a local Node.js environment or path environment. Or um, uh, there's a thing called Apex which has come out, which allows you to um, kind of create all your Lambda functions as a project. Because you have to understand these Lambda functions are just like a single JavaScript, you know, .js. You know. So Apex is quite nice in that you can organize everything together. Even though your functions might never talk to each other, just have one consolidated set is quite nice. So that's, uh, there's another one called Goad, which has come out, which is a um, load, uh, it's a load tester for Lambda, so you can predict what the load is and see the performances. But these are all written by the community. None of us are written by AWS, which is really interesting. Um, so AWS has just kind of gone, 
here's a tool we think is awesome, you guys build the rest of it. It's like a really 60-70% product that we need to build the rest. But, um, to understand how Lana works, I don't know. Um, is it, does it have a repository where you upload version artifacts or something? So you can't version a Lambda function. Um, like we've got GitFlow working for ourselves, so we have versions in GitHub essentially mm -hmm. of those functions and we can roll back in GitHub and which will then, with our um, CI pipeline, will deploy back to it. So Lambda, you just have the live function sitting there. Um, our guess is basically they're using a Docker repository on the back end for that, but there's no versioning of that at all today. So you do your versioning and get to GitHub. So how do you, you have a, a microservice, which yeah. is a, an architect, that yeah. you upload? Yeah, so... It gets called <coughs> during, a, during a web request or something? Yeah, essentially that's it. So, 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 um, how you actually deploy a Lambda function, there's, there's kind of three ways you can do it. Well, well, it's via the console. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, we do have a course on this, actually. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. uh, I don't think we offer the course for free. Uh, uh, sorry. We do have a course on this. No, but um, there's, there are three ways to do it. One is, um, uh, one is literally via the console, and you can copy and paste your code in. Um, another is via the CLR. Um, where you can the file, essentially, which has your code in it. Um, or the other way is you can import a zip file from S3. So well, the way we do it with the GitHub integration is we deploy um, the latest version of the code to S3 and then upload it from S3. So kind of the artifact you're uploading ends up being a zip file with all your dependencies. So, um, uh, we, we use JavaScript end-to-end, -end, um, front end, back end, everything. It's a brave new world. Um, so, what? Um, uh, yeah. So for us, our, our the S, that S three repository is kind of like a halfway house. It's a kind of intermediary stage for us. Um, but essentially, our source of truth is GitHub. You know, that's where I where we'll always work from. Um, and whatever is actually sitting in Lambda is just the current version that we happen to be using that gets up some source of truth. It's our configuration management database. It all changes. Using this architecture changes the way you do a lot of things. But it's the big thing you have to know is you can't move your applications today to Lambda. You have to rewrite, refactor, destroy it all, start again. And was it built, uh, was it Cloud Guru built from, from scratch? Yes, yeah. from scratch. Originally, actually, we started trying to do a Joomla website, which I was spent like, almost a month on. And then, so, <laughs> yeah, so we, we did originally try and start with a server architecture. And yeah, it was more traditional one with yeah. architecture. And just, the biggest advantage Lambda gives us, or too big, is we can iterate really quickly, um, and we don't spend time looking after the infrastructure. Um, we can focus on delivering value. You know. So the entire website's gone through, it's only six months old now, it's gone through an entire refactor, 100% rewrite of everything. Because as we've learned as well, we've made a lot of mistakes, but we've learned a lot of things. Um, you know, and there's, there's a lot more information coming out there. Uh, what we've seen most people who use Lambda is, there's something like that, a lot of plastic transcoding pipeline, lots of people doing that kind of stuff, because that's gets just isolated it's on its own. You know, um, you've got to transcode video into multiple different formats. That's a really nice, quick, and easy way to do that. You know, we borrowed code from someone else. Like, if you go to go through GitHub and, and just you'll see there's lots of Lambda functions. The other big thing where we're seeing it done is used a lot is Slack. Slackbots are almost all written in Lambda, um, and AWS is actively encouraging that. Um, they've got a whole lot of like uh, scripts you can just download and uh, edit it. Um, so a lo lot of Work in Lambda is someone copying someone else's stuff and editing it for themselves. Yeah, a lot of us can be true. Yeah, it's that's yeah. If you just search GitHub and for Lambda or try AWS Lambda, you want you know all these Haskell functions coming up. You see loads of stuff out there. Um, yeah, and like yeah, big difference is just this glue between all these services.